you probably don't want to hear this, but you do an SEO wrong. You're spending all of your time worrying about stuffing your pages with keywords and inbound links and outbound links because you think that's what search engines want. But I'm going to let you in on a secret. Search engines don't buy from you. People do. My name is Lorraine Ball, and over the next few minutes, I want to convince you to start focusing on content that actually answers questions that real people have about your product and your service. And if you do that, and you do it well, and you add that content to your website, not only will the people come, the search engines will as well. Ready to get started? What I'm talking about is a discipline called content-based SEO or common sense SEO that really starts with the questions that people have when they are in the process of buying your product or service. And the truth is, it's not one set of questions. People move through the process and they have different questions at different times. For example, as they're getting started, if it's a product they've never bought before, they're going to have a lot of what are known as informational questions. What is? How does this work? How can I solve this problem? Then they're going to dive in a little bit more. As they learn more, they're going to get into what's called the navigation questions. Who sells these kind of products? Where can I buy these kind of products? Next, you have commercial investigation. Now your customer or your prospect has a pretty good idea of what they want to know, and they're starting to do some fine-tuning comparisons. Which is better, A or B? How many people prefer this product over this product? What are the features of each of these products? And those comparisons will help them figure out what they want to buy. And finally, the transactional questions. How much will it cost? Is there financing? Is there a warranty? What's their shipping policies? And so as you're thinking about all of the questions that your prospective customers have, think about dividing them into these little buckets of, I'm at the beginning of the stage, they have these questions, they're in the middle of the phase, they have these questions, they're ready to buy. And you need to be prepared to answer all of those questions. Once you get that really long list of these are all the questions my customers have, and one of my favorite tricks is to go to Google and take what I think are great questions and start typing them in. Not only will I see how other people have answered that question, I will also see a list of related questions. Google will pop up and say, there's this question, but people have also asked. And you may end up with a much longer list of more interesting and more relevant questions. You can also find questions in your email. What are the questions people ask you? Make a list of what goes on in a sales conversation. Talk to your salespeople and customer service team. Don't be afraid of creating this ridiculously long list. And then sort them. Pick the ones that you know are asked most commonly, that are signals that you really have a stumbling block that you have to get over. And then what I want you to do is go to your website. Take that first question that you know, we got to answer this question, and type it into the search bar for your website. Does your website answer that specific question? I am amazed at how often I work with a client and we have that list of questions and I type it in and nothing comes up. 
nothing specific, maybe a vague article that kind of touches on it. But if that's the most important question you need to answer, you need to answer it. And there are lots of ways to get that content on your website. You can create an FAQ page that answers each little question in a snippet, or better yet, create blog posts that answer one question and then link to it from that FAQ page. Those keyword rich, comprehensive answers are what Google is looking for and what people are looking for. These days, everybody has brief answers on their website. If you really want to get noticed, you got to give them more. You can also use the process of internal links because what that does is it connects visitors to your website from one piece of information to another related topic. And the more of those internal links you have on your website, the more you're moving people from here to here to here instead of, I came for this, I got it, now I'm leaving. Internal links give people multiple reasons to stay on your website. And finally, you want to think about the rich snippets or the excerpts that summarize what every page is about. Instead of making sure that it's stuffed with all the right keywords, make sure it tells Google and the prospective visitor what the page is really about, what question does that page answer? Because these days, what we're seeing more and more is when I go to a search on Google, before I'm presented with any solutions, I get those summaries that are AI generated that kind of pull information from a lot of different places and present it. And then if that information is not sufficient, people will scroll down the page. And if they scroll down the page, if your content is kind of superficial and it says exactly what everybody else says, nobody's going to come. The other reason to have that rich snippet connected to that blog post is because more and more we are seeing a portion of your search traffic being siphoned off to social media platforms. Social search is on the rise. And so what you need to think about and what you need to do is have content that not only are you sharing to Google, but that you're sharing on social. And again, using that very comprehensive blog post that really answers that question and sharing part of it on social media and saying, if you want more, Here's where you can find the rest. As you're putting your content together and as you're answering the questions, you have two audiences and you need to be writing for both of them. Yes, you do need to write for Go Google, but I'm going to let you in on a secret. It isn't really as smart as you think. And so when you put a blog post or a web page together, you need to tell Google in your using title tags and identifying this is the most important information on the page. This is my H1. This is my H2, heading one, heading two. You need to tell Google this is what the page is about. And you, you do that with a good excerpt. When you put that information together, now Google can go through and read your page and go, oh, that's primary information, that's supporting information, that's additional information. And so you need to have all of that for the search engines. But then you also need to be sure that you are writing for people. And one of the things that I noticed as I was trying to 
create content for both audiences is people have shorter attention spans than Google. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure you get the punchy information, the most relevant information right up at the top of your page. And then the supporting information can come later. A lot of times people won't ever get to your supporting information. And that's, you know what? Okay. Because they came what they were looking for. That supporting information is what helped Google decide your page was worth sending people to. And you don't need to be a world-class author to create meaningful and relevant and compelling pages if you know a few tricks. As you're writing for people, you need to remember that words have power. There are words that have strong meaning and they're likely to trigger a psychological or an emotional response. These words are persuasive, pushing people to act. And they fall into one of several categories, seductive, emotional, sensory. And let's take a look at some of those words and think about how you can use them in your marketing. Seductive words are words that kind of override logic a little bit and can compel people to act. New, free, because even if I'm a little suspicious of your product being new or free, the fact that you've offered it that way gets me a little curious. And surprisingly, because... Simply giving people a reason is all they need to give you a try. The second kind of power word is an emotional. And here you're tapping into emotionals, into emotions with your headlines. It's a little more challenging because there isn't really a short list of words that you can use. Instead, you need to consider the emotions themselves and figure out how to tap into them. Common emotions that drive action include fear, jealousy, curiosity, joy, surprise, anger. Not all emotions work the same way. For example, anger may cause someone to share something on social media, but not purchase a product or a service. In contrast, Fear or jealousy may actually drive someone to act or buy. As you're thinking about this, be sure to take a look at what your competitors are doing and see what kind of language they're using. The third category are the sensory words. And these are words that paint a picture in the mind of your reader. They're descriptive words and they're designed to activate one or more of our senses. They describe how we experience the world, engage the eyes with words related to color or shape. For example, gloomy, dazzling, brilliant, foggy, gigantic. These words create a visual picture. You can also use words that create more of a texture feeling. Gritty, creepy, slimy, fluffy, sticky. Words that connect to one of your senses are powerful motivators because they create a more vivid picture in the mind of a prospective customer. And finally, there are words that are actually really connected to buyer intent. And there's a long list of them, but just a few might be best price, benefit, closeout, comparison, discontinue, discount, free trial, free shipping. Think about the words that people might use when they're looking for your product. Where can I find? Where can I buy? How do I improve? Is there a low cost alternative? When you use power words, you are more likely 
to get a response from a prospective user. And finally, as you are thinking about your content, one of the things that I want you to do is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't try to completely reinvent the whole wheel. Start with what you got. Take a look at the pages on your website or the blog posts you already have and re-optimize that content. One of the easiest things to do is if you have a page on your website that's kind of almost there, add 100 words, add a little bit more information, add a testimonial, an example, a case study, something that makes that information a little more unique. Add a picture, add a graph, add not just a random picture, but a relevant image that supports whatever you're talking about. Add internal links so that page isn't sort of standing out there on its own. Connect it to other information on your website. One of my favorite, favorite authors in the SEO space, Neil Patel, said that he used to write, you know, four blog posts, five blog posts a week. And he stopped and he started writing one new blog post a week and using the rest of the time to re-optimize what he already had. Now, he had a ton of information. But even if you've only got a little bit of information on your website, regularly going back in and re-optimizing that content will raise the quality of everything on your website. This was a pretty fast overview of content-based SEO, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions, and I'd love to take an opportunity to answer them. You can certainly find lots of information on this topic at More Than A Few Words or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want to dive deep, be sure to look for our content-based SEO class also on more than a few words.com.